Um, I'm Kit Needham, um, Director of Project Olympus, uh, Assistant Dean for Entrepreneurship Initiatives at CMU, where we help uh, students, faculty, staff, uh, anybody who's got a startup idea explore the commercial potential. And uh, with us, we have um, Stephanie Dangle, who is my partner in crime. Who is Hi, looking for the presentation. I'm a professor okay. at All right. So she <laughs> works at law, <laughs> law school, and we've been putting together these Smart Star series for, uh, for a number of years. And with us also is Rhonda, who is my counterpart <laughs> at uh, the Big Idea Center at University of Pittsburgh. Um, so she sort of does what I do. And the one who's going to uh, keep the train on the tracks is Tiffany. And so it's waving hi. And also on my staff is uh, Matt Katsaris, who is, uh, works with me in Project Olympus uh, and keeps the lights on, literally, uh, amongst other things too. So uh, one of the things we always do before we start any of these sessions is we give everybody an opportunity to um, do a shout out uh, if they have somebody looking for talent, somebody who has talent that is looking to join a startup, uh, anybody has an announcement, or if anybody needs any help with anything. Uh, to uh, uh, This is an opportunity to just really quickly, just so to say the name and what you're looking for. And it's particularly important now because uh, it's so hard to network and, and get to know people and find the resources. So we're getting close, guys. <laughs> we are. Yeah. So um, do we have any takers? So Philip, I'm just going to pick on you. You just want to say what you do. You don't have to have anything you want to know. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Philip here, um, CEO of Leica, and we're trying to develop a device that can measure your pressure in the head non-invasively. At the moment, the only way to get that parameter is to drill a hole through the skull and put a probe in the brain, which carries significant medical risks and it's pretty convenient. Uh, so we don't have a specific ask today uh, when it comes to team members, though we kind of want to put ourselves on the radar. Um, you know, in the spring, we might be recruiting for uh, either software or hardware engineers, maybe both, um, but more details to come. Okay, well, thank you. And all right. All right. Bear with me for just a second. Okay. I've got to get my, I get back on the screen now. We're going to <laughs> fix our technology here so it actually works for us. Um, let me get, I'm going to get Kit set up. So I'm going to do it this way. Dun, dun, dun. First, I'm going to share the screen. Make sure I have that right. And And then all right can you guys see the regular presentation or do you see the presenter view you can see the regular presentation awesome and i'll turn it over now for kit oh good go thank over. you <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh we usually when you talk about a team what you're thinking about is more you know who's going to be a co-founder you know who you're going to help you with uh your marketing sales uh technology development uh, but in this case, what we're talking about is truly your professional team. These are not people who work in your company, uh, and, but these are important um, for you to think about this and plan for it and eventually recruit and gather your team. So who will be part of the professional team? Uh, usually we start with the lawyer. At some point, you might have an accountant. Um, you do that particularly before you end up getting a CFO, which comes up much longer, much later on. Um, you have an insurance agent uh, because after you form a company, you need the director and officer liability insurance. And ultimately, at some point, uh, when you get some money, you're going to need a banker. But there's also uh, a less formal roles in there in terms of advisors, mentors, and ultimately, we're going to talk about the board of directors. So I would say the first person that I would really start looking for to build is on, with your lawyer. Uh, because one of the things you want to do is get it right from the beginning. So believe it or not, I'm used to call this how to shop for a lawyer, um, but because a lot of times people get intimidated a little bit by lawyers, but you've got to get over that. 
Um, this is an important, as important part of your team, sometimes it's like a co-founder. So there's some categories of things that you're looking for when you're searching. But I will tell you um, that one of the biggest mistakes that I, is done by startups in there is not hiring a lawyer who specializes in entrepreneurship and understands venture capital. Uh, you would not get an orthopedic surgeon to do your brain surgery. And uh, it's a, sometimes people do it because they're going for inexpensive. Um, so they get the Uncle Joe or the family lawyer to, to come in and, and help you with, usually it's the easy uh, stuff like articles of incorporation, which is pretty, you know, cut and dry. Uh, but in this case, um, what you really want to do is find somebody who's got that experience. So uh, when you hire somebody like this, what you want to do is how many startups have you worked with? You don't want them learning on your dime. Uh, you want somebody who has been um, around the block a number of times with startups in there. Uh, what other types of lawyers will I need? So let us just say that you are going to be developing some pretty cool technology. So you might need an intellectual property lawyer. Uh, you may need, if you're here on a F-1 visa, you may need an immigration attorney. Uh, you may need uh, your own attorney. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And one of my litmus tests on this about whether they really are a startup lawyer, because some claim that they have the expense, is do they uh, file 83B exemptions? So this is a very special type of thing that startup lawyers know, but lawyers, if you're not in that field, might not, and it can cost you a lot of money. When you vest your shares, at the time of vesting, you have 30 days to file this exemption. And what it does is it locks in the rate you will pay when you exit or sell the business at the current market value. So let's just say you vest 25% in the first year, your corporate value is maybe a dollar per share. I mean, it's not much at all. Wouldn't you much rather pay a dollar um, taxes on a dollar than you would over like maybe $500 that might happen at the end. So, um, so that's, that's the litmus test that I use. So in terms of experience too, um, we, uh, David Lehman, who often does many of these series with us tells, his lawyers, as well as I think Stephanie tells her law students, is if you went into law because you, you didn't like math, you got to get over it. So this is an example of how different types of funding impacts how much equity you own. And your lawyer should be doing this for you, that they ought to be giving you the comparison so that you can see the difference. Um, and it's it's there in black and white. And if lawyers, that's that's what I mean by doing experience. Uh, inexperienced lawyers are those who don't specialize and it won't do that. Domain experience. So what is your business in? Are you software, medical devices? Are you gonna be dealing with the government? Um, ask um, about the other startups that are in, if there are any that are in the domain you're in. So the reason is, let's just say you're going to be dealing a lot with our federal government, these three letter agencies. Well, they know their way through this. They know how funding happens. They know how decisions are made. They have contacts. And so uh, right away that you're, they're not learning how the federal government works again on your dime because you pay by the hour or the 15 minutes actually for, for some startups in there. So you wanna know if they have worked with startups like yours. Um, ask about rates. This is not a, uh, you know, how, how does the money work? Uh, and sometimes they will do a flat fee for bundle services. Other times they charge by you know, what I call the hourly rate or some do every 15 minutes or so. Um, are they willing to defer payment? So many times that they will. Um, but also ask about the auxiliary services. So we found that uh, one of our startups, not knowing to ask this in the beginning, um, was asking for paper copies and turns out it was like a dollar a page. Uh, so you don't wanna, you wanna say, well, no, how about if you just send me the electronic uh, version and I'll print it out myself. There are times when it comes up, you might hear somebody say, well, you don't have to pay me a fee, but I will take equity. I have an opinion about that that I think it can cause a conflict of interest. 
Uh, and uh, though I know that some lawyers do that, but um, Stephanie, you want to weigh in on this? I mean, I, I feel the same way. There are lawyers, particularly in California, who will take equity instead of attorney's fees. But I think it, you know, it can taint their vision because they're making their decisions on legal advice uh, based on their own um, skin in the game. <laughs> and yeah. so instead of um, giving you sort of the objective, like, don't do this or do do this, um, in the back of their mind, it's hard for them um, not to to uh, taint their answer by thinking about, okay, how's this going to affect the bottom line and my share? So I don't, um, it, it's not common in Pittsburgh, but California firms do it. I don't know whether New York and Boston firms do, but uh, if it's offered to you, I would, you know, I think it's always good to talk to more than one lawyer. And I think it's important, you know, to, to ask other lawyers what they think about that kind of a practice. Um, before I would agree to that, I I would tend not. I would tend to go for a lawyer that, um, not necessarily with startups charged by the billable hour, but that will give you a flat fee because you need to uh, try to keep your expenses under control or deferred expenses. Would be my approach as opposed to going with someone who is taking equity. Okay, so I know that there are a number of law firms in town that have what we call startup packages. So they will do your articles of incorporation. They help you with either your bylaws or your operating agreement, depending on your structure. And they will um, do um, your first contract, which is uh, could be just an employee or something. And it's just for a flat fee. They know you don't have money. <laughs> uh, and so they're betting on the future. And so they know cash is king. So if they are, um, uh, so they don't want to, rob you of, of the fuel that you need to grow. And so they many will defer it, but we'll talk about how long that should happen. Uh, how well do you work together? Um, do, does it, do they get, do get each other? Um, are you comfortable asking questions? How do they respond? Um, the, so a lot of it, you're gonna be communicating a lot with your lawyer and some of it is even style. Um, so, uh, I know that there was one, um, it was a faculty that happened to be interviewing uh, with some lawyers and found two that he he really liked. But what he said, what decided him to go with one versus the other was that uh, that one lawyer um, preferred that he get sent emails, um, whereas the other one was more than happy just to hop on the phone and not charge if it was going to be a kind of a quick question. And so the faculty preferred to somebody who would actually take the telephone call. And so you can even ask, I said, have you worked with students before or whatever your level is, um, just to see if, you know, give you some examples. Do they believe in your idea? Um, so they're not, you're not just a piece of business in there too. Um, but I have found uh, that some of the, the people that I've worked with that have you know, even had the successful exits and really there, that your lawyer can be one of your best business advisors as well. So they not only understand law, but they again have seen uh, how you know, different strategies would work. Uh, they have connections with people. Um, Sometimes you'll find, did they do any research before meeting with you? If you have briefed them on their idea and if you have a website in there um, and sort of buying into the vision. And it's what I call sort of leaning in. Um, you don't want somebody who thinks like, oh no, this is not gonna go anywhere. But you can ask them about their any potential thoughts about the business, um, what they think. Um, have they seen something like this before? So other questions that you can ask, um, you know, a percentage of your practice over the last few years that have been with startups. Um, and this is a little tricky one in there. How many have started with you and stick with you? Um, that because sometimes, uh, the, you know, I have had, there's one lawyer that I know many of my startups had started working with and they all pretty much um, found another lawyer at some point. It was more around billing issues. Um, and but you might need to you know, get some backup strength in there about once you get past the early stages when you get into like dealing with the VCs or dealing with an exit. Um, 
do you charge for attending board meetings? Um, most lawyers do not, they, they shouldn't, but um, you need to know that up front. And sometimes you could just ask, can I talk to some of the clients um, that you've represented and get their testimonials about how they feel? So I know at least I can, I think um, Rhonda can do the same thing, is that we know startups and we know who their lawyers are. I usually ask that question, you know, who is it? And then I will just send them directly to the company or to the students say, you know, what's your experience with so-and-so in there? So uh, there is, you are in control until you actually sign the letter of engagement. So this is a document that the lawyer will present you, and this is their formal contract with you. Read it, understand it. But it's also okay to negotiate and discuss possible changes to the agreement. Don't be intimidated by this. If there's something there that you can just ask, well, is it possible if we can do this a little differently? And I'll give you one very good example. Um, and the uh, managing costs, in particular, and this is you look for this or include it in your letter of agreement in there. Decide whether you want to pre-approve payment for copies, telephone calls, anything that's outside of time. Ask that projects and budgets be defined before work begin. You don't want the surprise. And I had one of my startups that was quoted, it was gonna be $8,000 for the work and then they got the bill for 22,000. And I call it the robot moment because I could hear them <laughs> as they're opening up the bill and uh, end up spending gobs of time uh, trying to understand how that got to that point. Uh, didn't understand why it was, I mean, almost three times what he was quoted and finally end up, um, well, that was one obviously that he only paid what he was quoted and then found another lawyer. But this is important, what I call the magic write-in. And I've gotten this from tips from my own startups in there. Until notified by client, all billing costs for work to be completed must be discussed in detail and agreed upon in writing by both parties and pre-approved before the work begins. Uh, so, but you also need to be a good client. Uh, don't defer payments too long. If you can give some minimal amount per month to some sort of a retainer in good faith uh, until you get some funding, uh, do that. Uh, read and understand the documents. Uh, it, that is part of your job of running this company. Uh, pay your bills on time when you get them. Uh, I've seen some cases where I'm gonna put the lawyer at the bottom of the list. Um, it, that's Don't do that as a regular practice, but if you're going to defer it, call up the, let the lawyer know. I just say, here's my problem. Uh, is it okay if I, and then you can sort of discuss and negotiate it. Um, so do some research on your own by attending Start Smart, such as this, or using other Olympus or Big Idea Center resources. Firing a lawyer. Uh, so you get them in and it starts out, they all start out great, great relationship. But let's just say they stopped being responsive. Uh, I've had one of my students once that was about ready to go on a very important uh, negotiation deal with a potential client and was waiting for the final copy of what the, the contract was going to be, standing by the printer, um, literally waiting um, because like 10 minutes from then they had to be at the, at the office. So he was going to be going into this meeting without having the opportunity to read the document that he was going to be um, negotiating uh, in advance and really think about it. Occasionally you'll have some that overcomplicates things. Um, and there is a tendency with some, and I tell you, this is, um, they end up coming off my recommended um, ones that um, they, they give it to the paralegal or they farm it out and you begin to see uh, errors or sloppiness, stuff that you thought you had taken out and then all of a sudden it's back in, like they run out of version control. Um, and charges exceed quoted amount or show up unexpectedly on a repeated basis. Occasionally it will happen, but um, there are some that have the reputation for that happening. So I'll just pause for a moment uh, to see if there's any questions there about um, finding the right lawyer.
So okay. Um, the one thing I would say just to add, um, don't just interview one lawyer. I mean, take advantage of the opportunity to speak to multiple lawyers. Um, lawyers, you know, if a lawyer is bothered by that, then he's not the right lawyer. You really need to meet with um, several startup lawyers and get the feel for whether you think this is going to be a good working relationship. But you shouldn't just assume because a friend of yours had a good experience that that's the right lawyer for you. You should really talk to more than one. Excellent. Great point. So now I'm going to move on to the next category of advisors, boards, and service providers. So a director and an advisor, their role is different. Directors support your obligation towards proper corporate governance, and directors have a fiduciary legal responsibility to do what's right for the company. Advisors give you support, but they don't have any legal responsibilities or liabilities on this. They're just trying to give you the best advice or help that they can. So what is an advisor advisory board? So I hear this term a lot and I get, you know, they even tell you not to use the word board if it's about advisors in there. Um, an advisor is an individual or group who help you manage, help you move your business forward. Again, usually with advisors, as I said, there's no legal responsibility there to do what's best for the company. Uh, but what we try to do, we always do, is try to get you connected with people with domain expertise or uh, supplement you know, the areas that you need, um, who you will meet with, um, sometimes a one-time deal and other times uh, multiple times. Why do you need them? Um, well, functional support, <laughs> you're going to times and you need the emotional support. Um, you know, things are going to go through a patch or maybe you're dealing with an issue with one of your employees or co-founders. Uh, uh, your advisors give you access to, to customers, vendors, financial investors. Um, that's what they're there for, is to help you, you know, take those next steps. Why do they do it? Um, there are some that, you know, that believe in you. It's the goodness of their heart and they just really want to help. Uh, others uh, really get excited about staying involved in the field um, and think that what you have is a new, going to be the disruptive technology. So they're enthusiastic about what you're doing. Uh, occasionally, they'll leave for cash, money, or equity, or they're looking to create a job for themselves. So uh, I'm going to talk in a minute to about, um, do you pay the advisors? What should you give them? And I'll give you some guidelines on that. But I will tell you, when you first start to meet with an advisor, if somewhere in the first five minutes up comes the question of, are they going to get equity? They're not a good fit. Um, I consider that or anybody who says, uh, I'll take equity um, for making these introductions to these people with money. I consider that predatory. Um, the advisors that I work with, they do that for free. That's what they're there for. So um, advisors, mentors, coaches, um, people who give you advice on an ad needed basis, no legal obligation, uh, diverse background. And you should look for, make a list of what do, type of advice do I need? What type of help do I need? And with great intentionality, begin to seek these people and almost like the lawyers, sort of interview them, get to know them and see if these are individuals that are, are adding value. Uh, they understand you. They're easy to communicate with uh, and they're not paid. Think of them as like mentors, coaches and sort of experts. Uh, I have, for example, uh, Project Olympus, we have our domain expert page and these are volunteers. They've already decided to give you a half hour of their time, no cost. And I'm sure the Big Idea Center has those uh, introductions that they can make as well. But you'll find over time that there are some that are particularly helpful. And I would call them advisory team. These are the ones that you communicate with on a regular basis and reach out to them to sort of give them updates um, and kind of go out and ask for, does anybody know or can anybody help me with? Uh, having a good advisory team of people who have an established relationship 
can give investors confidence that you have some adult supervision or somebody who's been there before um, who knows what they're doing to kind of keep you on track. Um, may get equity, but generally it's under 1%. And also just like founder shares, vests over time. Uh, so if you don't know the concept of vesting, what it means is, let us just say, um, as an advisor, I'm going to be getting 1%. And I would vest that. I, I would not have entitled to it per se, but I have to earn it. So let's just say my vesting takes place over four years, which is a very typical time frame. I would get 0.25% after 12 months of doing the advice and giving, you know, following up and delivering on what I say I'm going to do. And if I don't, you know, I would stay around for 11 months, I don't get anything. And I have to literally perform for it, just like you as founders. Let's just say you're going to get 40% of the company and you get 10% each year. Um, your other team members, they have to execute on what their what their job description is, what they're supposed to do. It's just not an entitlement that has to be earned. Um, and the advisory team, again, has no legal responsibility. So keeping advisors informed and engaged can be a pretty um, time-consuming thing. Uh, if you meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. And there are times when you're going to want to do that, um, but that's best for sensitive or complicated issues. Uh, so you can pull your advisory team together and do them collectively and just do an update maybe once a quarter. Uh, but what I found, and I actually learned this from some of my startups in there, they began to do just say an email advisory. So let's just say you're meeting these advisors and it could be somebody who is, uh, you know, wants to stay involved, um, but maybe not gonna be there on a regular basis. And you could just ask them say, uh, about you know, every three weeks or so, I put together just a real brief email to send out to everybody to let them know what I'm doing and see where I need help. Um, would you mind being put on the list? Um, and you can come off anytime you want if this is you know, not relevant. And I, usually if I could pull up Andy Cham was probably the master of this because everybody wanted to help Andy. And he um, would just to say, bullet point, it's not a newsletter. It's not a, you know, not, it's just literally a bit of, you know, finish the such and such um, meeting set up with so-and-so. And then he would have, you could do an ask. He said, uh, does anybody know anybody at uh, General Electric that I can talk to who's in this and such space? And You'd be surprised who um, some of these advisors, you know, the networking is pretty good. Um, make sure you include your founders and employees so they know what you're saying. And um, just um, that's a way of keeping them informed and engaged. And I saw one um, where Andy needed some help with something and he usually did a BCC and this time he didn't. And the responses, it was just like within 10 minutes, you know, he got like six responses right away. So people who are advising you are trying to help you. And one of the things that you want to avoid is getting the reputation of being uncoachable. And the way you get that is because you argue. Now, it doesn't mean you can't disagree, but there's a productive way of doing that. And so let us just say you've got this, in fact, this actually happens. Um, people sometimes get into accelerator programs, they come back and literally it's called mentor whiplash. So one's telling you to go left, the other's telling you to go right, and you think you should be going down the middle. And so it's one of those, you know, what do I do? Well, first of all, really good mentors and advisors suggest or they ask really good questions to make you challenge some of your decisions or directions. So it's getting you to think about things a certain way. But other than, um, you know, I am adamant and I will tell you about doing customer discovery and getting a startup lawyer. But other than that, what I try to do is say, you know, I can't tell you what to do, but here's what I would be thinking about. Uh, and so it's more of a suggestion and to explaining why that is. But if you get some of this pushback from the advisors, you can just say, well, you know what? You're telling me to go left. And I was sort of thinking, you know, I should be going down the middle. Can you tell me 
explain more about why you are suggesting that I go that way. Keep Just keep on asking why, 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 and you'll find the basis for, it could be an experience they had, it could be something that is not quite as on, you know, on point with what you're trying to do. So you have a, um, why is this happening? Uh, or why are they saying this? And you can even say, well, if that's another advisor is telling me, is suggesting I go right, and you're saying going left, can you help me figure out or sort this through? But don't argue. The way to do this is to ask a lot of questions. So finally, now the board of directors. Board of directors is required when you form a company. And this is a legal fiduciary obligation to act in the best interest of the startup entity. And let me be really clear about this, that they have to do what's best for the company, not necessarily you. And it may be there are times when they say, well, you know what? Uh, you've been a great person so far, but we need to get a different CEO. Uh, so uh, you may need to get your own personal lawyer at some point. But the point is, don't miss it. That lawyer that you hire is working for your company. Now, obviously, you're, if you're the CEO or you're leading it, then you're sort of working with you. Um, but the, the lawyer has to do what's right for the company. And if the board of directors acts improperly, that they actually can be sued. They have an exposure to corporate liability. So um, this is not a, by choice. This is by law. Why do you need a board? Well, first of all, it's legally required um, for incorporation um, that I call it adult supervision. Um, you'll just find when you get into this, you get into the weeds or you get emotionally attached and they sort of pull you back out and say, okay, let's get perspective. Uh, boards can also be extremely helpful for, for fundraising and business development. So I would tell you, keep your board small particularly when you start, I mean, three people or whatever, because once you get them, it's hard to get rid of them. <laughs> you can't uninvite them necessarily. It's your board that literally has to decide that that board member has to go. And that's an awkward conversation. So Stephanie, um, I asked David about this not too long ago. You want to amplify on that? Uh, um, in terms of, sorry. Size of the board and- the uh, how to get rid of a board member. But you can think about it if you want, but do you want me to go on or do you want to think? No, it's, I mean, it. Uh, if it is a corporation, so if you're an LLC, you don't have a board of directors. You need to be a corporation or a benefit corporation, have a board of directors. Um, only the board of directors can get rid of a director on their, so, it is not the founder of the organization to just decide, oh, well, I don't need to have any directors. Coordinating can try to convince other. You're breaking up. Particular yeah, I know. And, and let me. I don't know what. Hold on a second. Get better. Yeah, go ahead. Try again. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry, I'm trying to get better Wi-Fi. We're all having issues tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if uh, a board of directors is for a corporation, a benefit corporation, an LLC does not have the same board of directors. Uh, uh, there are members. But if you've got a board of directors, once a director is added, the only way they can come off of the board is by a majority vote or even higher of the other directors. So you have to, you know, even if you as a founder are on the board of directors, you've got to convince a majority of the board members to oust this other director. It's difficult to do. It's ugly. It, you know, it can taint the reputation of your organization. So you really want to keep your board small and choose people, uh, you know, that are at this point required for you to advance the company. You don't want to just add people because they've been good advisors and you want to make everybody happy. You really need to be very strategic 
as to who you're adding, because once they're on the board, it's very difficult to get rid of them. So I would suggest that what you do is when you meet somebody um, that test them out as the advisor. It's sort of like getting your uh, co-founders or other employees. You date before you marry mm -hmm. and just see how supportive they are and whether they're sort of al aligned with you. So there are times there are two contractual rights to a board seat in there that you as the entrepreneur, it's your company, um, but also financial investors. So if you uh, take uh, anything beyond friends and family type of money, uh, usually that, particularly with the VC, VC almost always insists upon having a seat. Um, and then you can have independent people that don't have a contractual right, but you bring on board um, because they, you are convinced that they will do a really good job in helping you be successful. Um, they're oriented to your mission and they can help you get cash. Uh, you know, get you investment. So um, oh, occasionally you'll see somebody, and I know that the organization in town will ask for a non-voting membership to your board. Non-voting doesn't mean non-talking. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they could be very good about giving some advice and it's good to have them there because they are in tune with what you're trying to do. But I have seen where occasionally the non-voting member talks a lot, it's very persuasive and takes the board in a different direction, but has no fiduciary responsibility. And so um, just be careful um, you know, before you do that, think, think uh, long-term about how the effect of that person will be. So board of directories, as I said, it's legal responsibility. They need to do what's best for the company, keep it small. And what is the board's responsibilities? Well, number one, they hire and fire the CEO. Now think about that. Um, and I've actually seen it happen. And I will tell you just in general, I'm not trashing um, VCs, but 75% of the time when VCs come in and invest in a company, within six months, there's a new CEO. They have to do what's best for the company. And sometimes it truly is best for the company. You're great in taking it from zero to 60, but if you need somebody who's gonna get it to cross the finish line and have a successful exit, uh, that they've done that before, and this is sort of their area, um, you are best to set a step aside. And you can still be in the company, you can still be active, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be running it. Uh, but just be aware too, this is why you want to be careful about who you pick for it. Um, they approve the strategic direction. Um, they assess the benefits and risk of the company's activities. Um, they help with raising funds. Um, these are, you want people who are well connected and they help you find customers. Uh, again, these are usually have some sort of domain expertise and uh, can help you build your network. So, any questions on the board or, or the advisors before I go on to the last category? I can't see chat, so. Um, There's no chat. Oh, there it is, it's up there. You can get the mouse over. Go to the side. Yeah. <laughs> I, I gotta help get the mouse back. We're on two screens here. Do, do, do. There we go. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm looking to receive OCC credit for the Start Smart yeah. session. Here is the OCC credit link, okay. <laughs> breaking up. Uh, did you get it? Okay. Um, and by the way, this presentation uh, is will be on the Big Idea Center uh, website. It will also be in the workshop archives uh, at CMU. Um, and I can also give at least certainly CMU, but I'm happy to provide Pitt with, if you're looking for lawyers that's uh, specialized in startups, at least for our list, um, we actually have the Pitt Law School review this on a periodic basis. And every lawyer in CMU's general counsel office looks at every lawyer on there. We do not recommend law firms. We recommend lawyers. 
And you got to be careful sometimes if you get a lawyer that, you know, they're at the front door, they get you in, and then they farm out all the work to their colleagues. And so the, they do not have the personal relationship with you or that in depth. Um, be careful. This is one of the reasons why sometimes you go get another lawyer anyway. Okay, service providers. And here's the list of them. Accountants, attorneys, um, bankers are not employees. Uh, these are people that you hire and generally should not be board members. Um, attorneys um, formally organize the company, provide the boilerplate docs, patent and key work. Um, they work for the company, not you. And eventually you may need your own lawyer um, in addition to the one that works for the company. I will just tell you in general, um, payroll is almost always outsourced. Um, the tax collection and reporting is um, can be a nightmare. Um, Pennsylvania cannot be fun sometimes. And the uh, you don't want to become or develop the expertise on how to do this because the regulations change. And I have one one of my startups, he was a CPA he had three startups and he said, I never do my own payroll. <laughs> it's just a, uh, a formula for disaster. And I have another appendix in there. What happened? Oh, I'm not, I'm off. Okay, no, there we go. Now you can. Okay. So uh, when I showed you the Harvard um, uh, Business Review and they talk about the top 10 mistakes, um, people say, well, what are the other ones <laughs> uh, other than not high in startup? And um, so uh, for those of you particularly who have University IP disclosing inventions without a non-disclosure agreement or before the patent application is filed or the disclosure. Um, starting a business while employed by a potential competitor. And this is big, promising more in the business plan that can be delivered. So I think Elon Musk got in trouble for this not too long ago. And the guy who started Blue Apron was saying, oh, we're going to capture this market share. We're going to do this and do that, too. And you get sued for that. Um, and don't put off the legal problems. Get to them right away. Um, and failing to incorporate early enough, but I'm going to do a caveat on this. Uh, make sure you do sufficient customer discovery and you know that this is actually a company that you, you're ready to go. And I would just say also, if you're here on an F-1 visa, do not form that company. Uh, we will be having a session in January, on January 31st, we just closed the date, uh, that will sp specifically deal with starting the business on an F-1 visa uh, and go through explicitly what you can and cannot do while you're still a student before you get an OPT. Um, don't issue founder shares without vesting. Um, because you want to, this is something that ought to be accrued over time. Um, failing to make the timely um, section 83B election, um, you have 30 days to do it. And once that you, you lose that. And I have one of my startups that had an exit. He was an early, um, early employee in a West Coast Silicon Valley company. And they had a really successful exit. And he was here in Pittsburgh working for one of our startups and was planning to pretty much live on the proceeds of what he earned from his, his shares, his lawyer did not file the 83B exemptions. And he had to quit to take the full-time job um, because he paid so much in taxes because he was paying upon it at the time of exit, not at the time when they vested. Um, and negotiating venture capital financing based solely on the valuation. So I'll just say about this, this is not a funding um, seminar in there too, but just like we're talking about shop around for a lawyer, uh, everybody gets excited when, oh, a VC wants to invest in me, you finally think, oh, money, money. Uh, not all VCs are the same. You've heard the old joke that they call them vulture capitalists. Um, and there are some, you need to do your due diligence on your investor as well as you need to do on your, uh, uh, on your lawyer. So, uh, this is the specific guideline that comes from the Founders Institute, which is a nationwide organization that works with uh, startups in there. And it gives you explicitly what they recommend that 
how advisors that you're actually going to be giving equity to, how much that is. And the top you can see is 1%, but it can actually go down to even a quarter of percent, depending on the stage and the level of what they're providing. Inexperienced um, or predatory advisors um, overvalue themselves. And you don't know better, right? Um, you think, well, 5% doesn't sound like a lot. Trust me on this, it adds up over time. You only have 100% equity. And uh, you really wanna save it for people who are going to be actively involved in moving your business forward. And that's it. So we'll take more questions. Got Rhonda here, we're sort of. Any questions or additional comments? Um, yeah. On what Kit was talking about. Uh, yeah, hi, Philip here from Leica. Uh, I was wondering about uh, the startup lawyers. So, you know, we're kind of might be looking around for some uh, in the coming days, weeks, months. If Is there a way to maybe get a list of ones you specifically recommend? Um, yes. Or should we just look around? Bill, just, just email, email me. And I will just say this, I will share this with Rhonda, um, I, if she doesn't already have it. Um, use the list and we you'll see next to there's some, uh, all the contact information and the first category is startup, second category is IP, and the last category is immigration, just depending on what you need. Uh, as I said, they're fully vetted and it's hard to get on the list, but it is easy to get off that list. Uh, but when you meet the lawyers, just don't tell them there's a list. <laughs> of <laughs> because course. then they contact us and want to get on the list. And you just say, your name was recommended, suggested to me as a potential uh, lawyer for my startup. So I try to avoid that list question because then I have to explain about why they can't get on the list. Um, so yeah, Philip, just email me. Okay. And anybody else who wants to, I'll share it with Rhonda and the pit people can, um, or, you know, can, can uh, follow up with her if they want to use it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Other questions? Hi, Kate. Um, I have a question regarding to how um, a startup using the uh, lawyer service, sometimes they don't have fundings, they rather offer you some kind of uh, future interest uh, to in exchange for your service. Uh, I saw some of the slides you have here point out the, the not so pretty picture of doing so. Um, do you have more advice on how this could work? Well, I think we covered it a little bit earlier than Stephanie and I both agree, and um, I see Rhonda here nodding too, that we uh, do not suggest or encourage uh, lawyers taking equity in, in lieu of in, in exchange for fees. Um, we believe it does create a conflict of interest, although Stephanie did point out that it is uh, not uncommon on the West Coast, uh, but it is not done so much here. Because think about it, that lawyer has a fiduciary responsibility. Why, why am I telling you, you're the lawyer, but um, <laughs> to do what's best for the company. But if they've got equity in the company and they're, they're thinking, hmm, what's this gonna do to my, my shares? What's this gonna do to my profit? Uh, so it may be good for the company, but other times when it might be personally um, a downside for him or her. I mean, it, I does, it does happen, um, you know, uh, in California, and if a lawyer is is contributing other values other than their legal services, I mean, if they've been with the business since the beginning and have other skills, then it might make sense. But I think the lawyer always has to sort of ask themselves, um, uh, make sure that they're giving their advice based on their um, the the law and not what necessarily is best for the business from a financial perspective. Um, and then lawyers also have to, you know, have to protect their own bottom line. I mean, it, it may make, you know, it would be nice to have the equity, but sometimes uh, the steady income of, a, <laughs> of a, uh, a billable hours or a set fee is better for both parties. Thank you. Uh, 
Others? You know, it's a relatively small startup law community here. So people know each other, they get along well. So again, interview, um, when you're interviewing somebody, don't hesitate to say, you know, I was gonna talk to someone else before I make my decision. They, they know that happens. It's important um, to be upfront about what you're doing and to, uh, to talk to multiple lawyers. So uh, I usually get the question in there, what about using like LegalZoom and some of these online services or um, Rhonda can talk for a minute too about the uh, Penn State uh, legal services, which they have tapped into. So I will answer about like what LegalZoom, uh, um, I would say, I don't say you get what you pay for. Some of the stuff is pretty boilerplate. Um, you know, some that you don't need a personalized draft of something that is you know pretty common uh where the dif difficulty occurs is when you start to get in something that it will more directly impacts your business i say let's just say you're going to do an llc and you want to see what the operating agreement is i think that's a good idea to download a, a standard template because then you'll see the different questions that or decisions that you're going to have to make of the different provisions so that you're oriented uh, as to what, you know, when you sit down with the lawyer to actually do it, you know what's going on. And it's good to sit down and do that even with your team and just saying, well, okay, how are we going to handle X or Y? Or we don't even know what this means. Maybe we need to do some more research. Uh, and um, you can talk about, talk about the Penn State thing. Sure. Um, and this going back to what Kit was saying about having attorneys that um, know what they're doing in the entrepreneurship space, um, there's an incredible resource available to any entrepreneur or small business in the state of Pennsylvania, and that particularly includes students, um, that is run by Penn State's, uh, has two legal clinics, actually. One is an entrepreneur assistance clinic. It handles all the transactional um areas of a business from your founder's agreement to incorporation to as you get into business contracts and all of those sorts of things. Um, and then they also have an intellectual property clinic that can help you with everything from just, you know, kind of basic trademark and, and, you know, those sorts of issues to help you think about your patent strategy and even helping file patents. If you're not in uh, a space within a university that kind of does that for you. But it's run by practicing attorneys. Both of those um, those clinics are run by practicing attorneys that actually provide free legal services. It's not just legal advice; it's actually legal services. So um, you know, it's a great starting point for um, particularly student startups to go in and get that early legal advice. Even if you're not ready to do anything yet, um, get in there. They can provide you, you know, great guidance. I mean, they've seen it all. <laughs> they've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, they know what you need to be thinking about so that you don't screw up your startup. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's a point at which you're, you know, you, you can take advantage of something like this, but eventually you are going to want to, you know, hire your own attorney that's going to be your longer term partner. But until you know that you're ready to get there, this is a great resource for you to uh, to at least check out and uh, and take advantage of. Do you actually sign any kind of agreement? Is this like attorney client privilege? Or there is it? attorney. Yeah, as far as I know, there is attorney. You actually, you know, you have to submit an inquiry to become a, a client of theirs. And so there is there is definitely attorney client privilege involved in that. Um, the only thing that they don't do like other law firms would do is to charge you for their hourly rates and the time that they um, that they work with you. You still have to pay filing fees and things like that. So, you know, the fees to file your incorporation papers and stuff like that, you would still be responsible for, but you're not racking up that ten dollars to $20,000 legal bill that could become unexpected. And we've had, I mean, I'm sure you, you've already <laughs> talked about it. We've seen that happen with our teams too. They get involved with attorneys and um, they don't realize that the hours are racking up and all of a sudden they get this bill and they have no money to pay it. And um, so it's a resource. I know that um, CMU has it on their resource page, how to connect with them. You can reach out to us at the Big Idea Center. We can send you the same information. Um, but we've worked um, we've worked with students that have been um, utilizing their services and they've been very pleased. So um, it's a resource that's kind of a hidden, hidden, hidden um, hidden asset that uh, a lot of people don't know to take advantage of. So. Yeah. So again, amplifying, I think what Rhonda said there is when it gets into 
very specific things about your business, that's when you actually need to have a lawyer who's not only familiar with you, it's grown with you. But what I've called a pretty cut, you know, articles of incorporation. Um, I, I mean, I think I could fill them out right now, right. but so it's a, uh, but it's good to have legal help with that. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry, actually on that, what, what was the service called again? I was just trying to look it up. It is um, the Entrepreneur Assistance Clinic at Penn State. Okay. And we can, we can, if you can drop your so uh, email in a chat, we can, or email, you know, Kit or myself, we can. Yeah, it's on it, project cmu.edu slash Olympus. And then you'll okay. see on the right hand side, you'll see a thing called entrepreneurial resources. And just click on that and just scroll down and there's a box. Yeah, you'll see it. Um, that you'll see that takes you, it describes it and takes you to that page. Okay. Well, so I think I can find it. Uh, yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was efficient for a late start in there too. Um, so um, <laughs> thank you know. for bearing with us on our technical like uh, <laughs> wranglings here. Yeah. So. One, one other uh, word of advice, uh, we have, we just completed our start smart on entity formation, but um, you, you should be able to find uh, online, I think with uh, both Kit and CMU, a copy of our legal roadmap questionnaire. And these are the questions mm -hmm. that you should really be thinking about and have tentative answers before you go to a startup lawyer um, to ask for their help in forming the company. So, you know, uh, they'll definitely help guide you through those. But if you can actually go through and answer those questions in advance, it will make the um, make it much easier to, you know, to talk to a lawyer and find the right one for you. And it should also save you time. Uh, when it comes um, in terms of they don't have to explain all the different uh, issues to you if you've already really thought through um, and watched one of our start smarts on these issues in advance, then they don't need to educate you to the extent and and time is money for lawyers. So doing your homework in advance is going to save you money. Yeah, you want to be an educated consumer. Um, and so, and some of these things we can walk you through that we've been through this and, you know, enough of, enough of these seminars in there too, if you uh, want some little bit of help going through it. Well, okay, you know where to find us. Um, and uh, in future questions, um, let us know. And this is our last Start Smart until the new year, correct? Right. Okay. And okay. which we will kick off January 31st. And Tiffany, God love her, she's so efficient, um, put it in the chat that if you are here on an F1 visa, uh, this is a must, um, must attend. There's certain things that you can do and certain things that you should not do. Um, so to keep you out of trouble. Uh, so this, this is excellent to get you off to the right start. Are there any global entrepreneurship uh, events this week that you want to uh, plug that students yeah. think about attending? I'm um, sure we've got two other uh, programs that are going on this week. Uh, one is sort of pit, pit located and the other one is CMU located. Uh, tomorrow evening, um, if you go to bigidea.pit.edu, go to programs, Global Entrepreneurship Week, um, you'll see the, the programs that are coming up. Um, tomorrow is actually a um, the finale and award ceremony for uh, a student innovation competition here at Pitt, uh, but we have blended teams, both Pitt and CMU, and um, that'll be uh, live streamed. So there's a, a link for you to be able to join via live stream. And then on Thursday, we have a PDMA competition that is uh, an event hosted by the Pittsburgh chapter of the Product Development Management Association. This is going to be held at the Schwartz Center at CMU. It'll be a live event and in person. Um, yay. <laughs> we get to go back and live and in person on some of these things. Um, and this is where um, student teams from Pitt, CMU, Chatham and Duquesne, um, we have undergraduate teams competing against each other and graduate teams competing against each other 
um, where they do a 90 second pitch uh, with a couple minute Q&A and uh, judges that have been curated from the different universities and PDMA will choose the best undergraduate um, pitch and the best graduate pitch and the best overall. So it's a great it's a great opportunity just to see kind of the, the breadth of student innovation going on across multiple universities, but also it's always great to see how people present uh, their idea and um, and do so in a competitive environment because when you're pitching, it's always competitive, right? <laughs> Whether it's amongst other people, but somebody's making a decision um, to, to you know, make a choice about your idea. And this one starts at 5.30. Yeah. Uh, all of our uh, virtual ones have been starting at five. And I've just as a little hint, what I find is you also see not only to hear the pitches, but where they lose it, mm -hmm. it's yours to win. Uh, but where you'll lose it is in the Q and A, absolutely, and because they're not prepared for it. So just as a little heads up, and notice how people who do it well do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Back to that, kit. That's <laughs> all I got. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you for uh, asking about that, Stephanie. There's one question about: Do you have any advice for filing a green card using? a startup. I think that's going to be covered in the January session, right? Yeah, th those two are independent. Uh, what you need to do is find a legal status that allows you to actually start a business. When you're here on an F1 or a J1, well, F1 in particular is the fact your visa only allows you to study. Um, and green part, so what you want to have is an immigration strategy about how to move forward. Um, so that's covered in that uh, presentation that'll be January 31st. If you need some help, in, like you're gonna graduate in December, let me know, but um, just uh, this is, I'm an alumni, this is why I asked the question. Oh, gosh. Okay. One big, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, does, does Larry Leibowitz offer office hours um, still for immigration law questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you can sign up for those right at the Project Olympus website if she wants. Larry Leibowitz is one of the attorneys presenting in January. He's an immigration lawyer, but he does uh, free office hours for people that have immigration law questions. 